Okay, so hello and welcome back to the Java programming series. In this video, we'll be looking at commenting, string formatting, keyboard input, and reading from files. So, quite uh, like some good good tools. So, let me just start off with the setup we need to start actually coding. So uh, in terms of comments, I showed last time how to make a single line comment. So that's just using two forward slashes. We can make a multi-line comment using a slash and an asterisk and ending it with an asterisk and another slash. And these are auto-generated, like you can partially auto-generate them in Eclipse and other IDEs. That's just one of the perks of using IDEs. So there's a multi-line comment. And there are these things that I didn't mention last video. Well, I didn't actually go over last video called Java doc comments. And these types of special comments are used for classes. They're used for classes and methods. Okay, so of course, we don't know exactly what classes and methods are right now, but just keep in mind that they're used for classes and methods. They're written immediately above them, and they're just for documentation purposes. They don't actually add any functionality to your code. But uh, they have these special tags, which are indicated by the uh, at symbol at that. Of course, you can see uh, there are all these different tags. And they basically just add metadata, so information about information to your code. Uh, so basically, if I write some, if I write a Java doc com, uh, comment like this above this class, what actually comes up when I hover over it is author, and then whatever I wrote, anonymous circuit. Okay, uh, and then there's uh, another typical one that's uh, written not necessarily above classes, really. It doesn't really matter, but there's also a version tag. And uh, you can uh, say, like, the date, uh, today's March 16th, 2022. Uh, now, here's the thing. These are typical names for them. Technically, you can actually say this, which isn't, which isn't an actual tag. But if I hover over this, there is at this. So you, you generally want to stick with what tags are kind of stand, uh, standard and recognized. Often it's just author and version. The point is Java doc comments add some extra information to your code in a more formal way. Now Java doc is a, a program that's in, uh, that's included in the JDK, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that kind of uh, can go through your Java files and automatically uh, dock up uh, an HTML doc uh, for essentially to essentially create an API for your uh, program or for whatever Java, uh, whatever uh, you doc you've documented using uh, Java doc comments. Uh, so like, if I go here, Java doc, it kind of it's essentially blank right now. But the point is, it creates an HTML doc for uh, kind of the implementation, uh, or how to use your programs, whatever you've uh, documented using Java doc, whatever you've put here essentially shows up in the HT HTML doc. Anyways, uh, now we should cover string formatting, which I actually forgot to cover last video, so that was my bad. But uh, there are two main methods, uh, like main main function, main commands we use for string formatting. So there's dot printf, and there is dot format. Dot format is the more so go to. Printf is kind of kind of useless if dot formats does the same as printf except it can it's more versatile i'll explain what i mean in just right now so they're both under the system dot out of course uh printf now what these take are essentially well at least one uh argument here uh, so we must pass in a string, which is of course a sequence of characters, as we learned uh, in the last video. In the last video, so we can say this is something, and I believe that should work fine. Yes. 
However, of course, that's kind of the same as print or print line. The use of print F is, of course, we have these things that we call conversion specifiers. So if I put, and just bear with me for a second, but if I put percent S and then uh, like the percent sign and then S and then say thing, and what we'll actually see is this is something thing. And that's because this percent S, this conversion specifier, we interpolated this thing, this string thing, we interpolated that into this conversion specifier place. So let's really understand what's going on here. When we use printf or even dot format, the same uh, format rules apply. And this even applies to Python and like C++, et cetera. But uh, the percent sign, it, it, it's what we call overloaded. It has multiple meanings depending on the context, essentially. <clears throat> That's what we'll understand overloaded uh, meaning as right now. So that's similar to the plus operator. Like it can be plus uh, like adding two numbers or adding two strings together, uh, like concatenating. But uh, when we put a percent sign in a string, particularly uh, in like the printf or uh, format functions or methods, uh, we, that, that <coughs> I'm sorry for my voice right now. I've been speaking for a while, but it, it, it uh, indicates the beginning of a, a conversion specifier. So some position we want to interpolate or like put in the value of a string of, okay? And now it doesn't necessarily have to be a string and I'll show that it can be like an integer or perhaps even a Boolean if you want. That's not, that's not very common, but that's possible. So there are different parameters we can add here now. Uh, of course, there's one thing we must always have after the percent sign, though, when we're interpolating values, when we have conversion specifiers, and that's the conversion character. S stands for strings, when we want to interpolate strings in. D stands for integers. Don't ask me why, that's just how it is. F stands for float, but it just works for any decimal value, so that also applies to doubles. And those are the main ones. And I believe B is for Boolean, but of course that's almost never used, but it is there. So uh, there are those conversion specifiers. So if I use percent %D, then I need an integer here. Let's say three. And this is something three. You can see it's, uh, that integer was interpolated uh, into the place of that conversion specifier. Now we call this a conversion specifier because I mean, so far all we've done is just simply put something in place of something else. That's not necessarily string formatting, but there are other parameters that allow us to actually format the string. So uh, first one, when we're dealing with actually, yeah, the first one I should probably mention is the minimum field width parameter. And what that is, is just a number like, I don't know, it's five. And what that means is that the, whatever value we're interpolating into, in for this conversion specifier, it has to occupy a minimum of five spaces, like five, character, uh, five characters is worth of spaces. If it goes over that, then that's no big deal. This is just a minimum field width. If something's smaller than this, then the rest will just be occupied by spaces. So if I put 5D, then we see that there's a whole bunch of space and then three. Now, what if we don't want the space on the left side, but rather on the right side? So what we have here right now is called right justification. So that's like right siding, uh, just pushing to the right, whatever value we have. What if we want to push to the left and then any extra space after? We just add a negative in front of whatever uh, value, of whatever minimum field width we have. And keep in mind, the order of all these characters is important. So, well, no, that was in the comments. Sorry, <laughs> I have to actually put it in the code here. Yeah, this is something three. Now you see all the space is after the three, four spaces. 
Now, what, uh, now when dealing with uh, decimal values, we can actually put a decimal after the uh, justification if we want to specify that and then the minimum field width. After that, we can put a decimal and then a number like one, two, three, whatever. Uh, let's say three. And then what that says is that whatever decimal value, I mean, we would really have to put in, put in like an F here because of course that's a decimal, that indicates a decimal value. Um, what would happen here uh, is that it would, whatever value we interpolate in for this conversion specifier, uh, it would be to the uh, nearest, and I say nearest on purpose because this actually rounds it, it doesn't just truncate it, to the nearest thousandth so the nearest like to the third decimal place so if i put in dot three and then f and then put in well three can also count as an actual double value wait we got an exception here i might have oh well first we need to like because in in the printf it can't interpret uh, the integer to also be a float so anyways the point is uh we have the float value 3.000 it's right it's left justified minimum field width of five characters so this actually occupies all five and the 3.000 and then uh, of course to three decimal places it's a float value or just a decimal value and it's 3.0 that's interpolated for it so that's essentially all there is to uh, string formatting. Of course, there are some other th things you can do with it, but that's that's typically the main uses, uh, the main features of string formatting we can we can do. Now, here's the thing: if we want if we wanted multiple values interpolated, like 4.0, and then we also have like percent f just here, then we would actually get an error with printf well no never mind that <laughs> never mind that but uh my point is uh there are small subtle what i was trying to point out there is that there are small subtleties in the difference uh, in use of printf and dot format i generally uh, just recommend using dot format because that is the more typical way of going about it it's more versatile uh so you just don't run into errors it's the same thing happens same rules apply Anyways, uh, so we've covered commenting, we've covered string formatting. Now we must deal with keyboard input and reading from files. They kind of go hand in hand. So for, for uh, keyboard input, so like user input into whatever program we're running, we actually have to import something. And that just means like, there are some things that are automatically recognized by Java, like what int means, what double means, what float means, etc. Or uh, simply what uh, system.out.format actually is. But then there are other things that aren't that aren't automatically included in what's automatically recognized. So we have to explicitly import them, include them into our program. It's essentially kind of like just copying and pasting uh, whatever we're importing right into our program. So what we have to import is the java.util.scanner. And this is a particular class. Now, bear with me, and this does get into object-oriented programming to some extent, but I'll still try to make it bearable right now. So what we'll do is type in scanner with a capital S, call it scanner one or whatever. We say that's a new scanner. And in the parentheses we put after the scanner, we have to say system.in. Now, of course, this line can look very confusing if you don't know what's going on at all, which I assume you don't. But overall, what this is just doing is creating a scanner object. It's creating a scanner, which is what we need in Java to read from, to read any input, in fact, to read any input at all. And what we read it from is the input stream. The input stream is basically for every instance of a scanner we create, whatever input is going into it, we have this stream of characters that's going into it, if that makes sense. 
If it doesn't, then it'll make more sense uh, as I go through the example. But the point is we create a scanner to kind of read any input, any stream of characters that comes in through the keyboard. Whenever we say system.in, we're talking about the keyboard. We can put other stuff here, which we'll get to when we talk about file reading. But system.in specifies that this scanner, scanner1, helps us read from the, in, uh, from the keyboard. So uh, if I say system.out.print, I, I want to prompt the user to put something in, like enter your name, OK? There are specific methods we use to obtain uh, to obtain information and data from the input stream, of course. So from we can say that string name is equal to scanner one dot next line. What next line does is if we have, and I'll just go to paint here for a second just to visualize this. If we have a whole bunch of characters, and I'll just put like n x y as an example, and then we have, and then like what will actually happen in the uh, Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll let this run and then explain what's going on because that'll make more sense, actually. So I'll say string name is equal to scanner1.next line. Just bear with me for a second. And of course, I have to like... Another thing I, I had to mention is that .format and .printf don't put a new line after whatever they output. So you should probably just put a backslash n in there. But yeah, the point is uh, enter your uh, enter your name. So enter your name, I'll put in circuit, okay? You see, after I pressed enter, the program stopped. We can see that because this is not red anymore, but it stopped. What happened there was that I put in some sequence of characters, I'll say N, X, Y. And then when I hit enter, what actually was input into the input stream along with the characters that I typed out was a backslash N because that's also what indicates a new line. Okay, so what the next line method does, what I did scanner one dot next line, what that does is goes up to the uh, to the earliest. So from the start of the input stream, it goes to the earliest or like the first uh, backslash n escape sequence, and gets everything that preceded that, and it just returns that. It gives you that. Okay, so what happened when I typed in circuit? That was everything before I hit enter. Enter gave in the backslash n. So what next? So that's that essentially um, like once the once I hit enter, uh, the next line went from the start of the input stream. So right before the C to the end, got the entire word circuit, and I signed that to name. So and you can, you can see that by working out name now. So if I say enter your name and I say yo, the name is yo. Okay. Also, let me just get rid of all these instances of, run, of the run. Okay, so that's pretty cool. But what if we don't want strings? What if we want to work with the numbers, right? We can also work with like booleans if we want and just use next boolean, but uh, that's usually, that's almost never used, but it, it is possible. Anyways, what if we want to work with numbers? After this, I can say, enter your age. Okay. And actually, int age is equal to, I can say that's equal to scanner one dot next int. Now I can dot out dot just print that age out. So if I say my name is yo, my age, let's say 20. My age is 20. Of course, it worked. Now here's when things get interesting. Okay, that worked. But what if I want a string after taking in a number, some numerical value? Of course, uh, next double also works. 
like here. But the thing is, we would have to say that this is a double. Uh, just keep in mind that there's ints and doubles you can do with the like next int and next double are both things. But if I wanted to say enter your pet's name or something like that, I just need to look another string. And say that that's scanner one dot next line. Okay. Watch what happens here. Enter your name, yo, page 20. Here's the thing. Enter your pet's name. I can't type in anything at all. Why is that? Well, that's because next int and any numerical value retriever from the input stream, that actually doesn't rid of the backslash n that's in the input stream. So what actually happened here, let's go with the information I passed in here. I entered in uh, my name, yo, okay. So I entered, I entered in yo. And then there was a backslash n for my enter. Okay. I called next line scanner one dot next line. So that took up everything up to the first uh, backslash n, and it took the backslash n with it. So that took that all of that out of the input stream. So at this point, the input stream was empty. Then I asked to uh, enter your age. Okay. Then I said in age was uh, scanner one dot next int. So I typed in twenty, and then hit enter. But what happened here is that next line actually went up to uh, the what next line? Oh, I mean next int. What next int and even next double uh, or next float or just whatever next numerical value? What they do is get the next numerical value, but they don't get any anything other than that. They just get the numerical value, mm -hmm. backslash n or anything like that. So it got the numerical value out of the input stream, but the backslash n remained in there. So when I printed out the age and moved on to your pet's name and said that a scanner one dot next line is pet name, then what happened is that I printed out enter your pet's name. I prompted the user, but then immediately scanner one dot next line got this uh, backslash n out of the input stream, and that indicated the end of the execution of that method. And so I I couldn't type anything in, and that's exactly what happened. So you have to be very careful about the stuff. So a workaround to this is, okay, perhaps we can put like the string uh, input string before the integer, perhaps, or like numerical value, but a more robust solution uh, in the case that you can't do that would probably just be to every time we, uh, we take in some numerical value, call the next line um, method. And that'll just take out the backslash n out of the uh, input stream. So if I say my name is yo, age 20, pet's name, I can finally type in something, doggo. Okay, done. So that's what you need to know about keyboard input. That's uh, it's pretty basic stuff. It, it's, it's not too much. Now, there are also some other methods uh, like dot has next. Uh, I can go over. Uh, why don't I go over that? So let's let's comment uh, let's comment this stuff out for now. Okay. So what I want to uh, do now is pose an example problem and I'll work through it with you. So if I if I want to go through every number here's the thing uh, i'm thinking okay what i'm thinking about right now probably requires arrays which we haven't learned yet but yeah actually no i'll, I'll leave that for i'll leave what i was thinking for now because we haven't even gone over loops yet either so We'll, we'll move on from keyboard input to reading from files now. So reading from files also uses the scanner class. However, when we create a scanner to read from a file, we don't pass in system.in 
for the argument to actually create the scanner, what we instead do is pass in a new file and a fi the file class is under the java.io um, package. So new file. And what actually goes on here is that outside of the source, I'm just going to create and like in clips, this is where you should create it because that's this is where uh, files are automatically looked for and then in the source. Uh, so I'm just going to create like a new file and name it um, something.txt or rather Java video. .txt. I'm going to put that under Java videos and right there. That's it. Well, not under the CCC, but rather not in the Java. Oh my God. Outside of the source. Okay. Just to the Java videos. There we go. Okay. So I can just type in text here and like, it's not gonna be recognized as job or anything. Uh, so let's say I wanna read text. Uh, the cow jumped over the moon. Okay. So I'm not gonna go over all the little nuances uh, with uh, reading files, uh, reading from files in Java because there are quite a few nuances that I might just cover in a separate video. But just the very basics, like reading text from a file or, or whatever. So I'm just gonna save that Java video two, then go back to the Java video two program. And in the file, I'm actually gonna say Java, like I'm gonna type in the actual file name I wanna read from, okay? Now, here's the thing. It's still giving me a red underline and error because reading from files must always be surrounded by what we call a try-catch block. What that does is basically uh, checks for any errors that might come up in some dangerous code in the try block. And then in case any error occurs, we can catch that exception that we call E and then do something in that case. In that case, I just want to like print out the exception, I guess. Okay. Uh, that's essentially it. In, in the case that you're not using Eclipse or whatever, and you're not using this kind of default read path, then what you instead do is just put in the fully qualified path uh, for the file you're reading from. So like from like, if I pull up CMB, then I would have like some uh, path. You want to put that entire path to the file uh, in this string here. Anyways, so here now uh, we've created a scanner to read from a specified file. Now we can actually use a while loop. And now actually, no. Instead of introducing a while loop, what I instead want to do actually is I'm trying to not use loops right now. So I guess right now I'm just going to show the bare basics. So I can say string line is scanner2 dot next and pretty much the same commands from uh reading from uh keyboard input applied to reading from file input so next line will of course go the same way it'll go to the next uh to the earliest backslash uh, like the first backslash n character and get everything before that so that's gonna get the cow jumped over the moon now of course it's not gonna do anything with that right now but uh i can do system dot out uh, print line line So the cow jumped over the moon. Cool. Okay, because that's what I had there. Now, in terms of reading multiple lines, you either have to know exactly how many lines there are and then not use loops and then just hard code like reading out the lines. 
or you do use loops, uh, which we'll go on, uh, go over later, but uh, not right now. Now, what if we wanted to read a number like one here? Okay, then we would just use next int system dot out dot print one. We can just directly put in the next int here. And that'll get the one we had in that file there. Pretty cool, right? Uh, there's also next double, next boolean, stuff like that. Like if I put system dot out dot print one center to dot next boolean, there's also that. Now, of course, there are other methods I want to cover, but right now that's the bare bone essentials of uh, reading from files. So that essentially wraps up this video. There isn't much more to go over with what we know right now. Uh, next video, we'll, we'll just expand our knowledge with Java. So see you next time.